Tonight we're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. And um, before we pray or read any scripture this evening, I have two things I want to say. First thing I want to say is that this message that's going to be preached tonight um, applies to those that have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. They have a personal relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus. If you're here tonight and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, before you leave this evening, I, I want to encourage you, urge you to cry out to Jesus Christ for salvation, okay? Um, I, I had to preface this message because I don't want people leaving here thinking, well, I'll give you guys the title here in just a second, thinking everything he, he said tonight applies to me. If you're not saved, this message applies to believers, those that have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. With that being said, the message tonight is called Joy in Victory from Doing That Which Pleases the Lord. Pulled directly out of the text, that last portion there, um, that which pleases the Lord, as you'll see here in just a moment. The next thing I want to say is in preparing this, you guys remember those old commercials, the seven-minute abs, and then it was like the six-minute abs. And Well, this is, this is like a, this message tonight, kind of like an infomercial for how to fix things quick. You want to know, how do I fix some of these areas in my life? How do I have joy? How can I be victorious in my life? And how can I do it rapidly? Tonight we're going to find out, because I promise you there is a way. And we're not going to cut any corners. We're not going to do anything. It's not even going to be a new radical concept. We're just going to get into the Word of God. We're going to see what it says. And if you apply the things that I, I share with you tonight, I promise you if, you, if you sincerely apply them to your life, I promise you, you will see changes, okay? Um, so with that being said, let's read it, and then we'll pray. Starting in verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. And twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. He removed the high places, break the images, and cut down the groves, and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made, for unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. He, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the king of, kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. And that's important. I mean, that part, this is um, that none that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah. For he clave to the Lord and departed not, listen to this, departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him and he prospered whithersoever he went forth and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. He smote the Philistines even unto Gaza and the borders thereof, from the tower of the watchmen to the fenced city. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, as we prepare to dive into this portion of text, I pray that you'd prepare each one of our hearts. Lord, as you no doubt have been working in my heart through this, I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that the Holy Spirit would do a great and mighty work teaching, reminding everyone that hears these things, Lord, that these are your words, that these things can be applied to our lives, Lord, in such a way that we can have joy and we can be victorious through you. But not only that, Lord, most importantly, I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that this evening you would be glorified through the teaching of your word. And Lord, we pray that your name would be exalted above all else. In Jesus' heavenly name I pray, amen. So, <clears throat> The first thing I want to talk about here is these high places. It says that he, in verse 4, he removed the high places, break the images, cut down the groves, and break in pieces the brazen serpent. So talking about these high places, these idols, first, if you're familiar with the Old Testament text and, and the, the pagan worship of Israel, you'll remember there's a god Baal, there's a god Molech, there's a, a god Ashtaroth, right? Um, I'm going to briefly tell you about each one of these, what they kind of were, and identify kind of how we're still dealing with some of these same issues in today's culture, and then we'll go from there. 
So with Molech, Molech, uh, Molech worship included child sacrifice, passing children through the fire, and I'll explain that in just a second, but also there were sexual rituals that went along with that. It's believed that idols of Molech were giant metal statues of a man with a bull's head, and how it was was that there was a hole in these, in these images or in these idols that was cut in, they would place the babies inside of them, usually their firstborn, and they would heat these, these brazen images up, these idols, they would heat them up, and then put the babies into them, and the babies in, on this hot brass would roll out. It would be so hot that it would burn the child's flesh, and it would roll out on the arms and then fall into a fire pit, and the child would burn up. And they usually did that with their firstborn. It was, it was very common, um, the pagan practice, to do it for the firstborn. There was a reason for that. They believed that if they sacrificed their firstborn, that they, it would ensure financial prosperity for the family, and also for prosperity for their future children. So for them to sacrifice one for the benefit of all the others, it, it made sense. And also with Ashtaroth, uh, was also pre- she was often prevented as, or presented as the divine wife of Baal, the sun god. Ashtaroth was also worshipped as the goddess of love and war. Worship of Ashtaroth was noted for the sensuality involved. Um, there was ritual prostitution, but also the priests and the priestesses uh, practice divination and fortune telling. So just the reason I wanted to share that with you is because these high places represented something. And what they represented was they, these people weren't just uh, offering these sacrifices of their children or other things of that sort for no reason. They were doing it because they were trying to satisfy something. They were trying to find joy in something. And that was the, the pleasing of the flesh the pleasing of the flesh of their children in the future, whatever it was, or his prosperity, whether it was good crops or good harvest or riches or lots of children, they were trying to satisfy a want and finding joy in that satisfaction. Now, these we're talking about Israel here. We're we're talking about uh, the Jews. We're not talking about the pagans in this moment, okay? Hezekiah removed the high places. So, What was the purpose? As I said, there's some type of fulfillment of the flesh. Even in Corinth, if you remember as we go through, uh, as we've gone through 1 Corinthians, teaching through 1 Corinthians, I've covered it multiple times in my Sunday school class. Um, Worship of Artemis there. There was, they they say that at one point in time, there was a thousand temple prostitutes. A thousand temple prostitutes. And that through that, um, obviously, there was all types of immorality in Corinth, and the people went in and You know, there was all kinds of immorality in the church that Paul had to come in and he had to rebuke. But all of this points to a common theme. It's man trying to find joy in things other than the Lord or trying to find something that would satisfy his flesh or his lust instead of allowing the Lord to satisfy his desires. And I know we think about it and we think, man, that's a pretty atrocious thing what they did with the offering of to, of their firstborn to Molech, well, we don't need to talk about in, in, in depth what's going on in America with the abortion rate. But the common theme is that there's nothing new under the sun, right? We have abortion, millions and millions of babies dying. The pornography industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. There's a reason for that. People are seeking to fulfill their desires and find joy in things other than their creator. And it's been going on for thousands of years. So, tonight I want to I wanna challenge you with this. If there is anything in your life that you think you need to bring you joy outside of Christ, if there is anything in your life you can think of right now, well, man, if I just had this, if I just had this, life would be a little better. It'd be a little easier. Man, if I just, you know, if I could just get this, or if I could just do that, I would be a little happier. If there's anything in your life you can identify, I just want to, I want to warn you, beware. Because our joy should be found in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We should, I, I, I say it all the time, Um, But even as Paul said in in Philippians chapter 4, when he said, I know how to be abased and I know how to be both abased and how to abound, he's saying, I know how to do without and I know how to do with plenty. I know 
how to handle these things in life. If I'm without or if I have plenty, it doesn't matter. Why? Because his joy, his strength, everything is from the Lord. So we're going to identify a couple things real quick, and then we'll begin to break down uh, exactly what Hezekiah, the implications of what he did, and how we can have joy and victory from doing that which pleases the Lord. So identifying some of the things in our culture, money, as I said, Things sure would be a little better if I just had a little more money to pay off this debt or to have a little more breathing room. Man, I'm just barely getting by and living paycheck to paycheck. It sure would be easier. I'd be happier if I could just come across a little bit of money. That's a lie. It's a lie. And because it's a, or because it's a, uh, a temporary fix to your problems, your joy is only going to come from the Lord. Look at men that strive after riches their entire life. They strive and they toil night and day. Sometimes they ruin their families. Um, there's just constant destruction in their, in their path. Why? Because they've, they're seeking joy in something other than the Lord. And it brings their life to ruin. You, it, it's, you, I promise you can Google it. Richest men in the world or, or um, people that have died recently that just seeing the riches, the, the turmoil and the, and the ruin that it's brought to their lives. And I, I want to clarify here, having wealth is not the issue, okay? Being wealthy, not a problem. If the Lord's pouring out blessings upon you uh, and finances, praise the Lord, use it to glorify him. There's a reason he's given it to you. Not a problem at all. But if it's your driving force, if it's the very thing that dictates, dictates your life, it's an issue. It has become a high place. And just as Hezekiah tore down those high places, you need to tear down the high places Next is sex. I'm going to keep this simple. Sex is a beautiful thing in the marriage bed between one man and one woman. Hebrews 13, 4 says, Marriage is honorable and all in the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Everything else, listen here, everything else outside of the marriage bed, everything else outside of the marriage bed is an abomination. The Lord, you, you can go all throughout Scripture, we can, start, we, we can start at the beginning, we can work through it, and we will see this theme of what sexual depravity has done to mankind. And the only time it's ever a beautiful thing in Scripture is when it's between husband and wife. That's the only time it's ever a beautiful thing in Scripture. So, as I said, it's an abomination, and it is a high place in the heart seeking some temporal joy or fulfillment. So I hear this from young people that I've talked to, even young family members. Well, he loves me, and I love him, and even though we're not married, it's a high place. It's an abomination. It needs to be destroyed. Well, my wife doesn't meet my needs, so looking at other women's my, my alternative. It's a high place. It's an idol. It's an abomination. Well, my husband hasn't been there for me emotionally, and this man, he, he makes me happy, so... It's a high place. It's an abomination. So here's the challenge is seek God's word and allow it to fill your heart. And we'll see that Hezekiah did exactly this. He was a man that was in love with the word of God. So seek God's word and allow it to fill your heart and thoughts and not those images on the screen or the thoughts of the other man or woman because that's not going to bring you joy. It's going to temporarily fulfill some gratification of the flesh? Absolutely. And then what? It's going to bring about destruction. Seek God. Eating. You're sad or upset, so you turn to food for your comfort. You're bored. Your time is filled with void, so you turn to food to occupy your time. That's sin. You're sad, depressed, upset. Go to God. If you're bored, pick up his word. Sing some praise music. Get into a devotional. Sing some Christian literature. Go out and tell someone about Jesus. Fill your time with productive, godly things. And if you are sad and you're hurting and you're turning to food, turn to the Lord for your joy. Turn to the Lord for your comfort. And we can continue to go on, but for sake of time, I'm just going to read these others off. Health and beauty. Security. In the marriage. If your spouse is what brings you your joy. You rely on your spouse to bring you your joy. Your spouse will let you down. I love my wife dearly, but she's not perfect. I'm not perfect. 
And if we're seeking one another for our joy instead of the Lord for our joy, it will fail. It will fail. Our children, many times I've seen, I've seen marriages that are struggling because one of the spouses, the, either the wife or the husband, all their emphasis is going into their children and they need their children for their joy. Your joy needs to come from the Lord. Material items. I'm gonna, this, might, this might upset a couple people here. Your iPhone or your Android, whoever is on the Android, right? So material items, clothes. Well, I gotta have, I gotta have the nicest clothes. I gotta stay up with the latest fashion. And you know, I, I gotta have the new gadget, the newest gadgets all the time. If I don't, you know, man, I just I don't know that I'll be happy. Finding our joy from the Lord and finally entertainment. And whatever that may be. You know, you guys know I'm 49er fan through and through. I love them, right? And yes, when they didn't even make it to the playoffs this year, it was rough. It was rough. But you know what? Guess what? It wasn't the end of the world, okay? It wasn't. I mean, the Patriots won, the Seahawks lost. It was all good. But the point is, is that it didn't dictate whether or not I had joy in my heart. It's something that I like. But for some, that is the case. Even with something as simple and as frivolous as sports and entertainment. So here's the challenge. As I went through that list, and there's, there's a plethora of other things that we could, we could name, I want to challenge you. Take the word of God and use it like a sledgehammer to destroy the high places in your life. Take the word of God and literally going through it, take action and destroy those things that are ungodly that are in your life. Destroy those things that have taken the place where the Lord should be in your heart. And this is a conversation I had with Ryan Jones, and I let him know I was going to steal this. But he said, if you notice, Hezekiah, he was, he was a man in action. He, was act, he actively went in and destroyed the high places and the idols. He was actively involved in this process. He didn't just sit back and read the law and say, all right, God, work your magic. You know, that's not how it works. He was in the word of God, and he said, this is an abomination. Get those things out of here. And he allowed the word of God to dictate his actions, but he was a man of action. So whether he physically did it himself or commanded his men, his men to go on and do it, that's not, the, that's not the point. The point is that he was active in the process just as you must take the word of God and be active in the process of tearing down these high places. And we're going somewhere with this. We cannot have these high places set up in our lives if we're to find joy in the Lord. We can't. We can't. We have to have them removed. So it's so easy to get caught up in one of your high places and you feel pity for yourself. You have a sin struggle in your life and you allow yourself to get paralyzed because of your own failure instead of going to the one who has already overcome, right? And I know we could probably go through here and we could all put out our garbage and our dirty laundry and we could share testimonies of how we've struggled with sin and it's just had us at times. But if that's, our sin shouldn't paralyze us. We should take it to the Lord, use his word and allow this to saturate our hearts and dictate our actions and our behavior. So just think about this. What if Peter, after he had gone fishing, right, his, his Savior, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is dead, and he's in the grave, and he's like, well, God's dead. God's dead. I'm going fishing, guys. Peter, you're doing what? I'm going fishing, man. God's dead. And he goes, and he goes fishing. What if Peter had never turned back to the Lord? You understand? But he, he didn't remain paralyzed in his state of sorrow, in his state of failure. What did he do? He turned to the word, Jesus Christ. And what did Jesus do? Did he send him away or did he receive him? He received him to himself again. And then what did he do? Something amazing. He sent him out and used him as a vessel to begin building the church of Jesus Christ. Do you understand? God used him in a mighty way. And what did he do? All he did was focused on the word of God, Jesus Christ, and went after him. He was a man of action even though he was a man who had failed. He was a man who had sinned, but he turned to the Lord and pursued him actively. So I understand. You know, I, I definitely have been there before. 
But here's the problem. The more I learn about God, the more things I find in myself that need to be destroyed. It's an interesting thing about the word of God. The more I seek his word, the more I grow in it, the more I'm I'm like, well, that needs to change, JT. (laughs) It's what happens. But that's growth. It's just the same thing as working with our children. Our children, as they grow, they realize more and more things. Well, I can't do this. I can't do that. I shouldn't be doing that. I shouldn't be doing that. It's just a process of natural spiritual growth. As we get into the word of God, it should be getting into us and changing who we are. So there's a couple verses here. John 3.30 says, he must increase, but I must decrease. Romans 8.29, and I'm taking portions of the scriptures here. Romans 8, 29, those whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine to be conformed. Listen to this, to be conformed to the image of his son. Galatians 2, 20, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So here's the goal. It's that these things need to be destroyed in our lives so that we look less and less like ourselves and more and more like Jesus Christ presenting a Christ-like image to a lost and dying world. Now, if you're in here right now and you struggle with, say, pride, because that's the example I have in here. You struggle with pride. Get into the Word of God. Get in the Word of God and compare yourself to God Almighty. You're proud. You're boasting in yourself. You're lifted up. Compare yourself to God. Get into His Word. Compare yourself to Him so that you might be humbled. You struggle with lust. Take action against it. Don't look at those things that will cause you to fall, but instead, get into his word. Look to God. When you think about that next promotion and the success or the benefits or the raise that come with it, remember, keeping in mind that these things are where you are seeking your joy. And you think that will bring you your joy. I want you to remember this little tidbit of scripture here, Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And I want to tell you, if your treasure is in Christ, he will never, ever, 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 ever let you down. He's the incorruptible treasure. He is the joy giver. I'll share even a a personal struggle of mine. So, my children, my beautiful, beautiful children. For those of you that have spent time around the Riley children, when all three of them are together, they are a wrecking crew. They are just, they're insanity incarnate, okay? I love it. It's beautiful. I've made them that way. So, and here's here's the thing. you know, this is just a perfect example. They can say, Daddy, can you, we're, we're all sitting there eating dinner, right? It's quiet. It's perfect. The atmosphere, we have a lovely dinner on the table. Allison just nailed it as usual. And we're sitting there eating. I'm like, man, this is wonderful. I mean, I'm thinking, man, we're going to read the Bible afterwards. You know, it's going to be a nice time of worship as a family. This is great. The kids are eating too. They all enjoy the meal. No one's complaining. Daddy, can you get me a drink? Yes, absolutely I can. I mean, yeah, I'm going to get you a drink. Who, who wants chocolate milk? You know, so I'll make them all chocolate. Do something special for them. That's like, okay, from my table to my refrigerator, six feet, seven feet, right? So I can just turn, and in the moment, in a twinkling of the eye, right? Okay, that's scripture. I turn, and chaos! Jerry has a bloody lip, you know? He's like, ah! Both the girls are sitting there like, ah! There's chaos screaming everywhere. I'm like, what just happened? And I think patience. And Allison's heard this prayer. Dear Lord, I mean, right? And Lord, help me. God, help me. Give me patience right now. I need it right now in this moment. You know, Jerry's mouth is bleeding and there's just pure chaos. And it was just, everything was perfect. I, I didn't see that creeping up on me, you know? But the point of it is, is in our moment of weakness, turning to Jesus Christ. She's heard the prayers. They are they are very audible. Lord, help me! <laughs> like, what just happened? But they are real. So the point is, turning to Jesus Christ, turning to the Word and your moment of weakness, not seeking these things for a temporary joy that will lead to destruction, that will, will lead to hurt and pain and sorrow, 
but turning to that very thing that is going to do nothing but give you joy and comfort and rest and peace. So, how do I take it to the Lord? When I fall, when I take my eyes off the Lord, I put them on myself, when we dwell more on the problem than we do the problem solver, how do I take this to the Lord? How do I take these high places you've talked about tonight How do I take them to the Lord so I can get this joy? Here's the secret. Remember, I was talking about that quick infomercial, seven-minute abs, right? Seven-minute warrior for Christ. I just, that's on the fly. Seven-minute warrior for Christ. How do I do it? You pick up the Word of God, and you take this serious, and you read it every single day, and not just real quick flip through it, but you allow this to transform your life. And I promise you, if you are in the word of God every single day, you will see radical transformation in your life. That's, that's the most promising infomercial you're ever going to hear. I just know that you can take that one to the bank, okay? You can be flexing your spiritual abs and you'll be an animal, okay? Get the word of God and really, really, Soak it up and allow it to make you an individual of of action to destroy these high places in your life. So there's the joy. Trusting in the Lord. We'll go through this next point pretty quick so we can get to the final point and, and really wrap all this up, tie it together. So going back to our main theme of joy in Christ alone, Psalm 28, 7, the Lord is my strength, my shield. Listen to this. My heart trusted in him and I helped him or, and I am helped. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song will I praise him. You hear that? My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. And because I trusted in him, and because I am helped, what does it say? My heart greatly rejoiceth. So how did Hezekiah know he could trust God? Because trust is something that has to be built. It has to be developed, right? So how did he know? Well, what does it look like? It's easy to say that I trust in God. Very easy for Christians to have that Christian lingo. I trust in God. But to actually mean that and to apply that to your life is entirely different. Hezekiah did something that the other kings of Judah failed to do. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, in sight of the Lord according to all that David his father did. So David was a man after God's own heart, meaning that he sought to know God and follow God and trust God. But that still leaves us with the question, how could he do this and how can we do this? How can we trust God? Here it is. We know and we love God's word. So the more we know about God's word and the more we see his promises being fulfilled in our own personal lives, what happens? Trust is developed. If we remember back in here in 2 Kings, um, here towards the end, it said in verse 6, I'm going to go to the middle of it, it said, but kept his commandments. How did he know the commandments of the Lord? Because he was familiar with the word of God. How did he know he could trust in the Lord? Because he was familiar with the word of God. And he had seen the promises of the Lord being displayed in his own life. As you grow in the word of God, no doubt your faith will be strengthened. You'll grow in grace you'll be able to trust the Lord more and more. I'm going to, just because their beautiful faces are over there, Christian and Shauna, who I love so dearly, but they're a display of trusting. They, they They are a picture of trusting the Lord. God called them to the Congo. Here they are. They're... You know, they're, they're actively serving here at the church. He had just graduated the institute. Hey, they have a home. They have beautiful pets. And the Lord calls them to the Congo. And what did they do? They didn't hesitate. They trusted in the Lord. Why? Because they knew that he was faithful. And they knew that the promise of his word, they knew that he was going to use them for something great. To go and share the gospel, and they knew that he would provide. They knew all of these things. So they trusted in the Lord. So, with that being said, how do I trust in the Lord? You familiarize yourself. You get in. You saturate yourself with the Word of God. Tonight, your fix-it problem 
is the Word of God. And I'm not just talking about picking it up and reading it. I'm talking about allowing it to permeate your being and allowing it to dictate your actions. So, here we go. Hezekiah knew, just as David knew, he could trust the Lord because he knew his words. Psalm 1-2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Hezekiah would have known this. Numbers 23-19, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Hezekiah would have known this. He knew about the promises in the word of God. And he knew it just as David did. And because he knew it and saw it as truth, he trusted in God. So we trust in God by knowing his word and seeing it as truth. So the problem that may exist in your life is you're not able to trust God as Hezekiah did because you haven't experienced his truth being displayed in your life because you're not familiar with his word. Seven minute fix it, right? Get in the word of God. Get in the word of God. This doesn't mean that all your problems are going to be fixed over, overnight. I'm not, I'm not preaching a, a health and wealth prosperity gospel up here. You definitely will still have troubles. You'll still have uh, trials in your life. No doubt about that. But here's the thing. Through those trials, through those temptations, uh, through those hurts and those pains and those hard times, the valleys in life, you'll find an uncanny joy. You'll find an uncanny strength. You'll find something that you never thought possible if you're trusting in the word of God and the promises that he makes to you. The word of God isn't something that we should take lightly, folks. It's not. You know, it's crazy because I hear about uh, people that are, are having to smuggle Bibles into countries and people just having little, little portions. And I don't, I don't know, I have like 15 Bibles in my house. That's not including all the ones on all of my different electronic devices. You know, it's not something that we should take for granted. It's the Holy Word of God. So, we're, I'm going to jump forward to, to the third point here. So Hezekiah knew this, therefore he kept the Lord's command. So knowing that he could trust the Lord, he kept the Lord's commands. And listen to this, so Joy and victory and doing that which pleases the Lord. That was the title of the sermon. He kept his commands and experienced victory. Let's read these uh, verses 7 and 8 again, or 6 through 8, one more time. For he clave to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments which the Lord commanded Moses. He kept his commandments. And the Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth. And he rebelled, listen, that prospering, we're not talking, now he was king, he, he obviously was wealthy, but that's not the type of prospering we're talking about, because listen to what he does. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. He smote the Philistines even unto Gaza. Do you understand what happened? Because he was obedient to the commands of the Lord, he was prosperous, he was victorious. And I want to tell you something. You, me, all of us are in a spiritual war. How are we going to be victorious? Well, looking at God's word, keeping his commands, staying true to his word, being men and women, believers of action, applying it to our lives. Jesus could not have said it more clearly when he responded to Judas's question in, in John chapter 14, not Judas Iscariot, but when he responded to Judas in, in uh, John 14, Judas asked, Lord, how will you manifest yourself to us and not to the world? How are you going to do that? And here's the Lord's response. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, we will come unto him and make our abode with him. So did Hezekiah, or so Hezekiah loved the Lord according uh, to what Christ had said? He did. Did he keep his word? He did. Did he keep his commands? He did. Hezekiah was a man that loved the Lord, and because of it, he had a victorious victorious life, uh, especially there as we see him going against his enemies in this war, in this battle. So it's a very important thing to identify with the, the text here. Something happened because of the obedience of Hezekiah, because of the actions of Hezekiah. Something happened, and that was he was victorious. So God condemned those kings who did not keep his commands. He allowed them to lose in battle. He allowed them to be devoured by their own wickedness. We're applying this to ourselves here. He allowed them to be devoured by their own wickedness and depravity. But Hezekiah, like David, 
kept the commands of the Lord because he loved him. He did not treat God as a good luck charm to help him with his needs. He just trusted and obeyed the Lord out of love. He trusted and obeyed the Lord out of love. And he was victorious. We can do the same thing. As I said, we're all in a, we're in a battle. We are at war, spiritual warfare. Read Ephesians chapter 6. We're not going to go through it tonight. But read it. We are at war. There's an enemy out there seeking to devour us. How are we going to be victorious? Through God's word. So the Lord was with him. He prospered, was successful in war. And wrap this whole thing up, bring it all together. As I said, we are at war. Make no mistake about it. Those high places in your life, those are strongholds of the enemy. Those are strongholds of the enemy. What does a military do if they have a stronghold in enemy territory? They use it to advance and attack the enemy to overwhelm and destroy them, period. You get behind enemy lines, you set up a stronghold there, and you continue to push forward. Why? To devour your enemy, to destroy them, to annihilate them, to wipe them out. That's the type of enemy we are at war with. He is doing everything he can to advance himself, to destroy our walk with the Lord as much as he possibly can, to snuff out that light. We're supposed to be shining. He's, he's seeking to do exactly that, snuff it out. So these high places, if not dealt with, will destroy you. They'll destroy your joy. They'll destroy your victory and, and your, uh, as you, you battle against Satan. However, if you cling to the Lord and his word, his commands, and take action, trusting in him to deliver you from the enemy, you will prosper. Also remember that when you fail, it is not because God let you down or was not there for you. He hasn't gone anywhere. It's because you let the enemy into God's territory and you let the enemy gain ground because something went wrong and you diverted from this. He said, well, for the moment, I don't need that because I'm going to satisfy myself here. What's going on? I'm overwhelmed. And go back. And that's what happens, right? I mean, if we're, if we're to be completely honest, we take our eyes off the Lord and then Satan eats our lunch and we're like, what just happened, Lord? What just happened? Allow yourself to be changed by the word of God. Never take this lightly. Allow this to be the foundation of your entire life. Every single aspect of your walk. Allow this to be the foundation. Allow this to be the truth. Allow this to dictate everything you do. And I promise you, you will have joy and you'll be victorious. How do I know? Because I trust the Lord and I've experienced his promises in my own life. And I've also experienced my own failures and the victory of the enemy the times that I've turned away from the Lord and sought my own pleasures, my own joy, my own desire in something other than the Lord. So I want to challenge you to seek God in his word. Then take action to tear down those high places we addressed tonight. That you might experience joy and victory. I said maybe you're in here tonight and you haven't placed your faith in Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you. All of us are sinners. All of us are sinners. And because of that, we've been separated from a relationship with God. It can only be reconciled through his son, Jesus Christ, who came to this life or came to this world, lived a perfect life, uh, offered himself as the payment on the cross by shedding his precious blood. And three days later, he rose victoriously from the grave. He conquered sin, death, hell, the grave, all these things. And he did it. Why? Because he loves you and wants to have a relationship with you. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You cry out to the Lord, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. God, save me. Be the Lord of my life. Save me. And he is faithful. And he will save you. And for all those others, if you have high places tonight, the Lord is working on your heart. Get into his word. Seek his face. Seek proper fellowship and allow those places to be torn down. Let's pray real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the example of godly men throughout your scriptures, Lord. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that we would allow the word to saturate our lives. That through it, Lord, we would, be, we would, we would have joy and we would have victory, Lord. And I know that we'll still face trials in this life. We'll still go through valleys, but even in those things, we'll be able to look upon your face and we'll still be able to know that you're in control, Lord. I thank you so much for your word and your promises and the trust that you've given me. And I pray that you would do the same for every individual in here this evening. In Jesus' heavenly name I pray. Amen.